Maverick. Noun. Unusual person. A visionary. Leader. Go-getter. An independent thinker. They see the vision for their life and pull that future towards them with an unyielding belief that things can and must be better. They achieve what most won't. Innovative, influential, daring, and direct with a remarkably high tolerance for taking calculated risk. A foe to the status quo. This is Passive Real Estate Investing with Mavericks. Your host, Neil Timmons, has been involved with over $300 million in real estate transactions. He's a published author, commercial property investor, and real estate syndicator. This show is for those who want to learn how to earn passive income through real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Neil Timmons. On this episode of Passive Real Estate Investing with Mavericks, I sit down with Spencer Hillegas to uncover the journey of a passive investor. Hey Mavericks, this is Ava Baukamp, and this episode of Passive Real Estate Investing with Mavericks is brought to you by Legacy Impact Investors. We are an industrial investment firm located in cash flow country, the Midwest. We strive to shield off risk and beat inflation, all while producing predictable cash flow. We curate real estate investment opportunities for busy professionals and other real estate investors seeking passive income. To learn more about what we do and connect with me, go to www.legacyimpactinvestors.com. Welcome to Passive Real Estate Investing with Mavericks, where we provide you actionable steps for you to grow your passive income and become job optional. During this episode, you're going to get to discover the journey of a passive investor. Now, for those of you who are new, I'm your host, Neil Timmons. I love passive income from real estate. Now, before I introduce you to today's Maverick, I want to make a request that at any point during this episode, you like what you hear, well, give us a thumbs up. Be certain to subscribe to the show. Never miss a valuable episode. If you love what you hear, give us a written review. Plus, be sure to look at the description of this episode. We packed it with thousands of dollars in free resources. Now, today, we've got the privilege to learn from a person who became financially free in five years from his passive investing journey. Prior to that, he was in fintech out there in the Silicon Valley. But ultimately, it all changed when he got turned on to passive investing in real estate. Now, I would describe today's Maverick as somebody who's passionate about learning and pushing the limits of what he can do in his own life. Today's Maverick, Spencer Hilligas. Spencer, how are you? Doing great, Neil. Really wonderful to start the day with you here. I'm, I'm excited to have you here. Say for the audience's uh, sake, who are you? What do you do? Where are you from? Yeah. So I'm based out here in the Bay Area, California, uh, just north of proper Silicon Valley. I was born and raised here, um, but never in my life did I expect that I would become somehow a full-time passive investor, as we say, in the investing real estate investing world. So that's what I do these days. I literally just got back as we were chatting about a moment ago, Neil, from uh, six weeks uh, abroad living in Portugal uh, with my whole family and my two young boys, nine and five. That kind of lifestyle is would have never been possible in my prior career. So I am sitting in Silicon Valley, spent 13 years in tech companies, uh, five different financial tech, fintech companies, um, building operations groups and working my butt off. I would argue too hard, too many hours. <laughs> in hindsight, yeah. um, you know, the 60, 80 hour weeks, I don't look back that fondly on those, but wonderful journey, learned a lot. And so these days uh, I get to focus on, frankly, investing in many of the assets that you also appreciate um, just across the country, particularly within the Sunbelt, um, multifamily storage. And what I do full time now is invest passively and manage our investing group at Madison Investing. It's a passive investor club. So just, it's, been a, it's been a wonderful, fun run. That's <laughs> great. There's a lot to unpack there. Take me uh, to the real estate side, and then I'll get into prior to real estate. But the very first commercial deal that you invested in or bought directly, what what was that? When was that? Yeah, you know, and uh, we probably won't go into this today, but I was born and raised in a residential real estate broker household. So, um, you know, that, that's a different tangent. Yep. But that's why I went into tech. <laughs> uh, I ended up investing in. Smart uh, man. Hey, full circle. I'm still back here in real estate, right? Yeah. Uh, so it was around uh, 2016. We started buying single family rentals, um, you know, not including our primary home here in the Bay Area, which is good appreciation, but not an investment. Um, eventually invest as an LP in around 2017. Uh, and then gangbusters from there. 
Uh, and that, that was in Texas. Uh, so that was in Texas, Dallas, Texas, uh, I think it's the number one, you know, it's a massive market as I've come to learn from many trips out there and investments over the years now, but, uh, that was the first one. Uh, it was a couple hundred units in Dallas, Texas. What took you down that LP path to begin with? You know, we stumbled through these in hindsight, three phases, you know, and everything is so clear in life when you look back hindsight, right? right. But at the time this felt as clear as mud. Yep. Uh, we were myself and Jennifer who's my co-founder in our investing group. We were working dual careers, her industry, CPG marketing leader, my industry, FinTech. And we just wanted to go build up beyond our 401ks. We had good incomes. So we started buying rentals phase one. Bought, bought a local duplex. It's do we still have it? It's here in Vallejo, California. Overpaid for it for cash flow. Didn't know what it meant to invest for cash flow. 430 grand, 200 bucks a month in cash flow. Still own it now, but that was a learning lesson, right? Yeah. Tough learning, tough tuition. Yeah. Um, second one, second phase, we bought up to five turnkey rental properties. And that was in Kansas City, Missouri, 60K a pop, around 250 bucks a month in cash flow. Way better economics. But then we got, we took our licks. We learned what semi-passive investing in a rental property means. Yep. We learned that we learned what happens when you invest in C-class and your property turns over the tenant once a year and kills yes. your economics. Right. right. We went through those stages relatively fast. So we got up to about, you know, seven doors technically, I think, uh, when we were doing the small property investing. And that's when we had realized we have a couple of young kids, Neil. I mean, we were working full time hard, waiting on that equity from those Silicon Valley startups, you know, those <laughs> It's right, like the unspoken lottery of Silicon Valley. Yes, exactly. Right, um, and, and you know maybe one of those five companies is still going to have a hit, but I'm not expecting that. Uh, we so that's what drew us over to finally saying, look, at at the time, this is around 2016. I was working in the guts of a established fix and flip lender. I never planned on going into a real estate or a lending company, but I saw the economics. I saw what happened when we were lending to over 600 individual fix and flip properties per month, and I had nothing. I had no interest in that stuff at that time. I had no interest in going deep on the numbers. I had no interest in the, becoming a full-time real estate investor, active or passive. Mm. But then I saw the numbers and I saw how straightforward it was. Yeah. Can't swing a hammer still. You know, I'm not a handy dude. Uh, I rely on YouTube every day around the house. I didn't want to go fix and flip. Uh, and I saw the horror stories, you know, I, at firsthand, the people I was managing were doing these things on the weekend. And right. I, and I was like, well, I know how to structure partnerships. I know how to review the spreadsheets. I know how to do the analysis. And I see how many zeros are on these, these, these pro formas that these investors are making. I just need something that clicks for me. I need something that looks bigger, more predictable, more, I'm not going to say corporate because that doesn't reflect it well, but I just need something that I can wrap my head around mm. predictability and scale. And then I looked at these, the, you know, I got introduced from reading 24 books in 18 months, overdid it, uh, listened to 400 podcasts, just to educate myself on nights and weekends, got a little obsessed, you know, don't just a anyone, little, just a little, <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think anyone needs to go do that, by the way. Yeah. Um, three books would have been fine, but, uh, I, I really looked at it like, wow, these numbers make sense to me. And yeah, I had to get over that same hurdle. I think a lot of us do, which is one door, one property seems less scary than a 200 unit, 300 unit, 400 unit apartment building that's sitting right. in the middle of, you know, of Alabama or sitting in the middle of Georgia, sitting in the middle of Texas. And it's, you know, hundreds of miles away. And so as soon as that clicked for me and we pulled the trigger on the first one, then it was all over, right? It, it, at that point, it was like, well, this, this seems like it's a really solid model and it does not increase our overhead. And we, and we're just too darn busy. People say passive investments don't exist, Neil, but Last thing I'll say is um, whether you invest in a mutual fund or a you know index fund or something as basic, basic as simple stock picking, there's always some. I hope there's some degree of due diligence people do on that. You know, I've been pretty fast to jump into some stock stuff, but stocks, real estate, whatever. Mm -hmm. The most passive of passive investments still require a little upfront work. <laughs> so, um, you know, I just wanted to mention that because that that was the most work that we, the least work we had ever done um, to get into. A f what I realized was a fully passive investment, and uh, and it was all learning and going forward from there. Here, yeah, I think you hit it. You you touched on something that I find interesting is uh, you know so often I hear oh evaluating a deal and, and understanding real estate, understanding where to place my money in into an opportunity as a limited partner uh, takes time, takes energy. It's it's not it's not all that passive on the front end, and 
if not this, then what? And the then what is what do you where you're investing someplace else? And most people, you know, stock market's the most common place to term. And most people can't even explain how it works, can't even understand how a company works, how how dividends work, how stock splits work, how how any of it even works versus an apartment complex is simplistic to understand. You have a box, someone lives in that box, they pay you for that and you do certain things in return, right? And then with inflation, the way it is, that box costs more next year for them to live there, right? But we get the benefit, right? So when you can do it, uh, I love what you've just touched on there because I, I think it's, people often gloss over that. Can I add one thing more to that? Of course. Um, thank you for, for grabbing on that. Uh, because I think it's, I've always found it best to just be de- remarkably upfront in most things in life. In my twenties, as, as all of us are, and we were younger years, that can be brash. Hmm. Perhaps in my, I look back at some, you know, as a manager role in my twenties, I look back, I'm like, yeah, that feedback could have been delivered with a little bit more polish. Um, but when it comes to being upfront with investing, it's so important to me to just say it plainly. And I love the way you just described, uh, you know, real estate investing and even investing in a large apartment community as an example, or I'm also very keen on storage, for example, and self-storage. So we do a lot of that, but it's just a big box. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's a, it's an asset. It's a hard asset. Didn't used to know what that term meant 15 years ago, of course, right. in the right professional terms, but same thing. It has an address. You're going to buy the thing, improve the thing through a couple of levers, operations, renovations. That's it. And over time, collect some cash flow and profits and then sell it at a future value. And it's a model that's elegant in its simplicity. But I think oftentimes I got hit when I first got into my very first one of these things and you're staring at the, the legal documents. Mm-hmm. It's a brick wall. Correct. Just a, there's no other way around it, you know? And um, I, I have found that like, whether it's our fellow investors in our investing club, and I'm providing some education for them just to be like, hey, I, I, I literally will just tell them, buckle up. I'm so glad you're excited. I'm so glad you see the same you know, numbers and potential outcomes and the quality of this asset and this market and this team that I do. But at the same time, just buckle up. Have you ever read a legal document? Have you ever bought a house? Try to give them something relatable. Like yep. you, you look at that home disclosure packet. That's the closest thing I can give right. to the average person out there. That's the biggest document you've ever looked at legal wise. <laughs> so get, buckle up. You're about to go sign some fields and read some new terminology because that PPM is dense. But once you're in, smooth sailing, right? Yeah, um, you're, you're, you're spot on. You know what they don't have you do in the, in the stock world is they don't have, they, although they print a prospectus. You're not required to read it and sign off on it before buying it. No what doubt. One does, you know, it's uh, if you're agreeing to the terms and policy, which all of us have done online, you click that little box or it pops up terms and policies and procedures and you scroll to what appears to be infinite that almost nobody reads and you click, I've read this document and you move on. Closest thing to it is like the Apple terms of service when we all add a new phone or upgrade yeah. our, 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 you know, our iPhone. It's like, well, that's a lot of legalese right there. Right. <laughs> yeah. Bring me, uh, bring me current on the deal. Tell me about the most recent transaction you were involved in. Sure. Uh, let's see. Well, we focus on two asset classes, you know, so we, really within real estate, love multifamily uh, for all the reasons we've been talking about and more. Also appreciate self storage. Um, I th- so we've actually been leaning into both of those, but on a more selective basis. And so within self storage, uh, it was actually a fund with some partners that we've worked with now multiple times. And, you know, we've done the, the single asset stuff in Dallas multiple times with some partners and very pleased with how that's going. But also the self storage facilities are just a little smaller. And when I say smaller, it's all by comparison to do a 60, $80 million, you know, $40 million, whatever, uh, apartment building, but fund structures seem to do better for a lot of these, uh, self storage facilities. So that was the most recent one. Um, and it kicked off, uh, just at the tail end, I'm sorry, the very beginning of this year, it's been a heck of a year so far. So it blurs, but, uh, that brought in, um, gosh, at least four or five self storage facilities already into it. And it's the kind of thing that I look at as the best kind of boring, uh, when done correctly. I mean, take it even further on storage, not to go too far on the asset. I'll just say analogy. We were talking about of the, the of the box yeah. Yeah. for an apartment building. Yeah take it to the nth degree and you got a storage yeah. facility, Yeah, <laughs> you know, big, yeah. big slab of concrete, 
Um, you got, In that you case, got the, it's literal. It, quite literal, right? And I mean, even the most sophisticated you're probably going to get is making it climate controlled. And that's about it. Um, but th that was the most recent one. I think take it a step back further. Uh, and we were, we were doing an apartment community also in Dallas and some of those opportunities that are becoming more interesting um, because of the reasons that you already know very well about. But for members of the audience, too, if they aren't watching this close closely as we are, um, it's hard to ignore. But interest rates are much higher uh, out there. And as a result, there's some opportunities popping up on the buying side uh, because of uh, some you know financial distress uh, for, for sellers. And so. Uh, that was the most recent apartment community uh, deal that we were actually looking at and bought um, and invested in. And so that was, uh, it's something that you like to think about. You've waited a while to see on the buying side yep. um, because, you know, people say, pick a quote from Warren Buffett in terms of, you know, be, be greedy when others are fearful, et cetera. But um, meaningful discounts are popping up. Um, and and that's, that's why we were excited about that one. They're, they're popping up and you've got to go shopping every day though, don't you? You have to be participating. You've got to be active and, and or working with folks on the GP side who are actively out there uh, turning over the rocks in order to find those opportunities that exist. That's right. Yeah. And and frankly, to exactly your point, uh, years ago, I mean, this is, this is back in you know, 2017, 2016, uh, there was a pivotal point just to give context for folks where I was trying to wrestle with how much on the active side did I want to become. Um, and I left my job, my full-time job and career in 2019 because it just became too unwieldy to, and it was a good problem, like managing and helping and serving our fellow investors and in our investing club simply was, was beyond a full-time job at that point in a good way. I had to leave my leadership job, right? Um, and that was before it was cool to do the quiet quitting thing. And that was, that was five months before COVID. Uh, but active versus passive and what level of involvement I decided at that point after talking to a mentor and he's like, Hey man, are you planning on moving back out of state from California again? And the answer was no, you know, and, and this is all leading up to me basically saying like, find great partners to your point, right? Like find great GPs, find great sponsors, find folks who are capable of going and operating in this environment. Because if you are not physically there as an investor, if you are not the one looking and talking to a broker network and nurturing that broker network who is fighting for these deals, you're not really going to have a shot because your ear is not you know, to the ground, you know, you don't have a finger on the pulse, whatever other, you know, health analogy I can give here, but you got to just keep an eye out for it. Um, but they are starting to pop up. I don't think that's going to be the last. I think we're going to see a heck of a lot more in the next six, 12. Um, so I mean, six, 12, 18, I'll give my crystal ball disclaimer here. I don't have one like everyone else. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're starting to pop up and I lean on those partnerships because we, that, that's really at the core of what I have found to be why folks find it helpful to like invest alongside us and stuff is because like it's it's not rocket science it's just a framework for vetting right it's like five things for vetting i look at the team who's the boots on the ground like have they done it before aka track record do they have a repeatable process behind that too um who's on that team like what's the gp team assortment like how, is, is it a, are they married do they know they're married is there two or three of them you know, and the legal side, how do they communicate with financial transparency, all those things. And so, and values, as corny as that sounds, we actually do have that officially like within our framework for vetting people is like, do they have a, some form of stated philosophy on how they want to treat their tenants, you know? And so, so we look at all that stuff and then lean heavy on the who, because the who, how they decide to go and manage their deals once they fight to acquire them now more than ever matters greatly. Um, because it's not as easy. You got insurance costs going up in states that we love, like Texas, right? You got insurance in Florida. Um, you got some some very volatile economic times. So you, like, you got to lean on those partners. And I'm not the one who wanted to go out and fly out and change our whole lifestyle and geography to uh, to go do that full time. Just that. Got to lean on partnerships. So thanks for indulging the tangent. Just wanted to give some more color behind it. No, I think that helps a lot, you know, and then I, I'm curious, you know, over the last six, seven years of of really sinking your teeth into this, you know, from, from start to not to today, I won't call it finished, start to, to today, you know, what are the biggest lessons you've learned along the way in going out, in vetting those partners, both partners, and then also from a, from a deal standpoint. So maybe give some mm. color to, you know, vetting that partner a little more. And then maybe once, once your partner passes that test, mm. understanding and analyzing that deal to know that, that you actually want to be involved in that particular deal with that partner. Yeah, happy to. First on the who, 
on the partner. Marriage, not dating. This is at the core of what we've done. We've walked away from so many great deals that have come inbound in the past two to two years, I would say in particular. I mean, it's been happening now for, you know, I'm grateful to say for about five years now, where deals come inbound from great up and coming new sponsors. They say, look at this deal. The like, economics are killer. Look at this market. All those fundamentals of a great market that you you likely appreciate as well, Neil. Strong job growth, population, demographics, in in you know, inbound migration, wage growth, et cetera, all these things. Big corporate footholds, even even better if it's government footholds for stability of jobs, et cetera. But on the who, it's a repeatable process. And, and I think that that's a very simplified way of saying, take any skill, take any habit someone has in their personal life, just to make it simple for folks. And like, I've got my nerdy guitar habit in the background here. Like, if I want to learn something and I really know it, I have put some blood, sweat and tears into know how to play a certain song even if it's wheels on the bus for my kids right now, you know? And if I can't speak to how I did that, just like an operator should be able to speak to, how do they go acquire, take over management of a property, third party? Sure. In-house, vertically managed? Sure. What is the detailed way that they go do that all the way through the management and disposition of those properties, if they do have the full, dis full cycle disposition of their properties, right? And so I think... I'm just going deep on one specific example of like repeatable process. I look at it as a sibling of when people say, what's their track record? Because track record just on exits can be pretty dis misleading for sure. <laughs> um, 2021 was a hell of a year. Correct. And <laughs> I think right now more than ever leaning into what does a repeatable process truly mean, particularly on things such as is the team doing renovations? If they're doing renovations, what is their supply sourcing? If they're doing renovations, who is managing it? If they're doing it at scale, how do they make sure that it's on on pace, on track, or ahead of schedule? Or you know, I mean, how, and how do they mitigate those things? One other thing I'll share is like, how open is the team about their misses? And if they're if they are open, what are they willing to share about what's been learned? And that's that's a kind of a basic sounding thing, Neil. But I think that that's borrowing also from the concept of behavioral interviewing from a corporate career interviewing and hiring and leading hundreds of people is like, if someone's truly the only value in having a mistake is if someone has reflected and learned on it. No doubt. Anyone can, I, I can go mess things up and I do that every day. <laughs> mess things up and my kids will remind me of that every day. Right. Um, but if I haven't learned anything from it, that is useless. So I think the value of failure response, as nerdy as that sounds, it's like failure response is the branding and our templated framework here is like, they should have a failure response in that muscle memory of, oh, we blew it in that circumstance with that asset. Or even if it's a parallel business, if they're a newer operator, newer sponsor, but they've been kicked in the teeth figuratively, not to be too grim or violent for folks with the analogy, but just really taking a hard hit in the in entrepreneurship, they will not have any shortage of details about that. Um, but it's when they glaze over. It's when someone glazes over. Um, that's when I start to get really uncomfortable. So I just wanted to cover kind of track record and and, but also a little bit of the failure response. Um, there's there's a 70 rows on that spreadsheet that we use right now, just, just for the main bullet points. So we won't go into yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on the deal level, uh, I think right now more than ever is if, if it's like multifamily, um, core principles is to like, okay, what it, are they buying the asset? Is the, is the sponsor buying the asset at a meaningful, at an actual discount? Um, and kind of questioning what does a discount even mean right now right. uh not, not to get too philosophical here right no, um we've got a moving to targets we're in a very uh, fluid environment very fluid environment um it's also tricky because repricing of assets can be based or biased from things like it's a private market but private market also using things like seller financing tends to prop up what would otherwise be a a, a, a discount you know like, like just all, all kinds of variables right right and all that to say, well, what's the debt structure? <laughs> Critical, yeah. back, almost a backbone of a deal today. Yeah. And um, I also think that not overcorrecting on, it is so much more appealing for all of us as passive investors right now uh, in, our lit, in our reptile brain to say, ooh, I'm looking at this deal. I want a deal that is safe. I want a deal that has something in the debt that says fixed. And there's a double-edged sword there, all right? And I think a lot of folks, particularly within like a value add right now, 
Um, if they're, they're looking at deals and if, we're, if I'm looking at a deal and it's like, oh, cool, I do like fixed rate debt. Clearly, it puts it, it lets everyone sleep at night. Um, it's also really expensive for, for people that want to go and do anything in terms of value add and then exit within the maximum time horizon for the hold. So, uh, you know, prepayment penalties, et cetera. So it, it, it's, it's that type of stuff on the deal level within the debt that I find really important. Who's the lender, you know, what, like, et cetera. So I won't go further into that one necessarily, but one other thing I would mention on the deal level is being even more conservative on things such as rent growth, you know, once we got into around, and I think I look back at deals in 2020, um, and, and interesting time, right? Interesting time, and I'm and great, grateful for how that turned out. Um, at the, in terms of the real estate asset pricing for the next year and a half, now we're on the other side of the ramifications there, right? Um, but if you're looking at the deals now and the rent, like 2020, the rent growth projections changed rapidly. Uh, within those Overnight. performers across the right. market, right? Correct. It was like two different halves of 2020. First half was like, hey, 3% out the gates, 5% out the gates, gangbusters. Second half of 2020, it was like zeros for the next two years. Right. <laughs> Looking for more of that right now, um, not necessarily zero, but you know, just being focused on what what is the right appropriate financial projections. If, if you're going to go push rents on something, what is the business case and how and what are the numbers going into those assumptions to mm -hmm. to really improve the value of that asset and that net, oper net operating net operating income um, on that asset. No, that makes uh, it makes a lot of sense. You have to pay special attention to those assumptions because they drive so much of that, depending on the project, right? Tremendous amount of the value. The overall return is on the basis of these assumptions being true and actually yes. coming to fruition. Totally. Tell me about, um, you work with investors side by side with investors. Tell me a little more about uh, how you work with investors on your investment club too. And then take me into your communication plan. Cause I think, uh, in our, you know, my interactions with folks in the environment today, and maybe you'll echo it. Um, communication is critical, especially yes. in, especially in, in, in some level of uncertainty, you know, uncertain times, if you will, the communication becomes more important during that period. Well said, man, do I agree with that, Neil. Increasing frequency of communication, only a good idea. It's just a great idea during volatile times. Um, and so our regular communication plan, one thing we've done, you know, we, we do a newsletter. I know a lot of folks do on our newsletter, just for the overall club level. Uh, we actually did two things. Went back to fundamentals on education from an LP lens first, from a passive investor lens first. And this might sound simple, but I really th think it's it's been, the feedback has been shockingly, uh, there's been more of it. And I'd say more positive than I even expected for something so basic. So that's the first thing I'll touch on. The second thing is I started putting together like a very robust quarterly uh, snail mail letter. I know it sounds very traditional, uh, but that, that's that been a labor, labor of love the last couple of quarters. Um, yeah. But we've gotten really, really good feedback on that. And I think you know, I say half of our club reads it half, half because the other half just says, oh, it's a piece of snail mail. Let's toss it away. Uh, but uh, those that read it really appreciate it. This, the basic passive investor lens that has been well received recently, as simple as the sound nail, is like how to look at a deal from like take out the notion of what it means to invest for cash flow versus growth from like a active real estate investor lens for a moment back into the let's say I'm coming out as a you know, big tech company employee making $400,000 a year. This is like just me trying to anonymize a couple of profiles of many people in our group. Mm -hmm. And they know a lot about RSUs. Like they've got a ton of RSUs. They, they're doing great on multiple 401k or IRAs. Like they, they, are, they are set, but they're looking at a lens of, okay, how do I even begin to evaluate all of these beautiful looking PDF marketing documents that are all showing very nicely photographed apartment buildings in different states that I've never been to, or maybe briefly visited. And the fundamental question above that, though, is: Is someone going for a goal on cash flow, or is someone going for a goal? Have they set a goal, a time-bound, simple stuff like time-bound goal of income, or a time-bound goal of growth for their capital? Yeah. What's the goal for the money? And I, I'm, I've been shocked as basic as that might sound to you and I, uh, you know, I find that valuable for myself when I'm evaluating a deal. So that's the kind of stuff we've been hitting on and more so, and even helping just plot for folks, you know, everyone typically, if they haven't thought about that, they say, oh, I want a little bit of both. And I've said that plenty of times too. I want sure. growth, I want equity, <laughs> you know, but right. not everyone does. Like if the real, the real Correct. goal for that, for that person might be, 
I have one kid. I'm, I'm, well, I'm making $400,000 a year. If I'm an employee in a big tech company, I'm, an, I'm a data scientist. I have one kid, infant. I have another that's probably coming in the next year or two. I have an, a generation older than me parent that's living in our household. I probably want to pivot out from my career within five to seven years fully. And when I ask, where do you, what, what's your goal? And they say, well, I want a blend of growth and cash flow. I'm like, well, okay, have you run the numbers? What's the, what's the dollar amount? And they haven't done that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Most people haven't done that. Right. But uh, that's where I challenge folks is just be like, don't rush into a deal. You know, like, like to, to just don't rush into a deal until you've sat down, at least thought about that. Like just, just why are you, why are you going to go park $50,000? or like a hundred thousand dollars or like 200, 300, whatever the number is for this individual, mm -hmm. um, to go do what they do. And, and then they get the, the more fun conversation, which I think is fun about depreciation losses and how that's a, a role as well, but like cash flow, <laughs> cash flow growth and depreciation. Right. So, um, I don't know if my, my, might be too basic. Um, but I, I, I think folks have found that to be incredibly helpful in addition to just market context, market education. Um, uh, one more thing to say on the deal level, which I think is at the core of what you're getting at potentially is like, if something's not going perfectly, because there are deals where it's like, well, yeah, uh, the debt service on this deal is really high. Interest rate caps are in place. NOI is looking killer, looking really good. Oh, this distribution has to be paused. That's just a fact of the matter. Um, and being upfront with folks, being available to explain that, like why that is, yeah. that was like, a, that, that was a six page snail mail letter that I put together back in Q2 when I saw where the market was going. And I was like, this is going to happen more. This is just going to happen more. I've exited two already full cycle deals personally that had pause distributions in COVID, one of which ended up being, I think ultimately in our group, one of these two deals ended up being the best performing of any property we've ever been in touch, we've ever been involved with. So like a short-term cash flow related issue mm -hmm. is scary. It makes someone question the investment and the asset. And in the end, if as long as there's the debt structures and the interest rate caps in place, these are the types of topics that are really helpful to educate folks more through. So um, we, I went a bit further there than I intended to, but hopefully it's helpful. No, I think it's terrific. And you, you, you know, COVID obviously is the first thing that comes to mind. And for those who are act, you know, have have an interest or exposure down south, you touched on it. The uh, insurance, insurance, in, in many cases, I, I've got friends who have indicated to me in parts of Florida, insurance has tripled, tripled. And, and before you know it, it's a six figure increase in insurance. It's a material hit to the cash flow of the property. I suspect over a period of time, you know, you're getting rent growth. There's other things in there to offset that over a period of time. Um, but as you said, there may be a temporary event that has to be addressed today. It doesn't mean it's permanent though. Yeah. Triple sounds, sounds like the norm right uh yeah. tripling insurance costs it, it, it's a key change that was fascinating to witness on the marketing decks and the, and the, the pro formas that we've been seeing in the market for the past i don't know six 12 months is that now suddenly you're seeing deliberate communicated proactively mm -hmm. really smart uh move from sponsors to say here's the here's the tax attorney we've already hired here's the here's the worst expected best case financially of what they they assured us that they can get in terms of fighting for the lowest possible tax burden right. <laughs> on this property and that's that that you did not see that at least on mm -hmm. many of the pro formas and and investment summaries and offering memorandums of you know the earlier you know or i should say like 2018 2017 uh, etc so that's a big change um and it, it's appropriate for those states i think spencer what are you most excited about this year man i'm most excited just about leaning into the buying opportunity. Um, I, yeah. I think that taking a long view in life is helpful 100% of the time. Um, you know, I can't say that about many parts of life, but I think taking the long view, my goodness, it brings me back to center anytime I need it, whether it's about being a parent, um, being an entrepreneur, um, you know, anything about family, et cetera, but certainly in investing, taking the long view. Example, we need more housing in America. Right. Um, obvious statement clearly, but, but I do think that folks tend to get really scared as we all do. I succumb to it too, in moments where volatility rears its head, same as in 2020, different moment now. Mm -hmm. And right now, as I've shared with many different members of our group and our investors, gosh, this brilliant quote, and I can't, I don't know who to give credit to Neil, but it was that there's no such thing 
as bad assets. They're just bad prices. And that could be applied to anything. That's why I love it. It's just an elegant way of saying you could apply that to a pen, to a car, sure. to a yeah. 400 unit apartment building. Yeah. Um, and right now we're entering a buying period for the assets that you and I appreciate and many of the listeners most likely. So making sure just to keenly pay attention and, and be ready for it because you exactly, you're really well stated point earlier, Neil, I do think timing and speed and paying attention matters. And so knowing, you know, if, if someone's out there and they want to participate and they're trying to figure out how just making sure that they've built the right network, that they're actually actively engaging um, with folks. So I'm fired up about that moment. I'm fired up about looking beyond, uh, you know, whatever current headwinds. But but I, I also think it's worth reminding folks, and I have to remind myself about this too. We've had a pretty pretty wonderful run of prosperity. Um, and so let's all be realistic coming back to earth as to how good we've got it and how good we've had it. And we're still all doing much better than I think we are right now. Um, no, I, agree with, circles. I agree with that, but I echo there with you. There's a lot of opportunities that are that are forthcoming. It's gonna be well, it's gonna be exciting. Let's do this. I want to move on to the, the final segment, what I call the final four. What do you think holds most passive investors back from hitting their next level, their personal next level, whatever that happens to be? Mm. You know, I, I pause because this is such an important question. And I think what holds all of us back as passive investors is that sitting down and starkly uh, or plainly, simply, whatever the right word is here, look at the facts, look at where you are, look at your numbers, look at your goals, and then look at where you want to be. And I think that that's honestly where most people hold, they are held back. And that's where I'm held back often is that we're too afraid to hold up the mirror to current and then just stare at it for a moment. Uh, whether that's, oh, here's the passive income number I want. Here's the passive income number I want to be at. Some people don't invest passively for income, the wealthier folks in particular, right? I net worth folks, they don't really need the additional income. They're looking at it as a de-risking mechanism. So what holds them back, I would say is there needs to be a way for them to kind of sit there and go, well, why am I still deploying here? Am I doing it towards a certain net worth target? Am I doing it for a certain diversification percentage? Am I doing it because I didn't get enough depreciation losses last year, but I need enough this year to offset something? Um, that's, it, it, that is always the hardest thing because it requires not being lazy. Um, it, you know, for a, a passive investor inherently is going to sit there in their mind thinking, I want to be passive. Therefore, I don't want to, to, to raise my hand up <laughs> using my computer and do this little bit of due diligence. I get it. I really, really get it. I'm living it. I get it. Um, but that's exactly when you need to lean in more because it means that if you're feeling lazy, when I'm feeling lazy about those types of topics, it means I haven't set goals that motivate me clearly enough. And that's where it starts. It's just holding up the mirror. What are you passionate about outside of real estate? You know, I, I think, uh, so I, I mentioned earlier, we were just coming back from this kind of six week experience living abroad. Um, it was pretty cool. And I bring this up on this top question because it was through a program that my wife found, uh, and it was, you know, a chance for our boys to go to a school during the day, you know, show them a new, new way to learn a more global perspective, et cetera. And we were also in a cohort with like 28 other families from different parts of the world, heavy on the US, got the UK, got Japan, got, you know, all over Australia, all these different parents and all these different families were trying to figure out a way to simply answer the question. And, and this is my synopsis of what is enough, right? And talk about a head spinner question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, do, I don't claim to have that answer. Uh, I'll always be chasing it. But in the end, I think what drives me now and what I think is ultimately something I'm passionate about, even though it is related to like it's enabled by passive investing mm -hmm. um, is frankly, like just connecting with other folks who are going through that same type of journey and helping share those learnings and figure out well, what does it mean to be, you know, I, the buzzwordy term would be digital nomad, you know, being right. able to live, for, live from anywhere, work from anywhere, but also adding value back into the real world at the same time and doing it. Um, that, that maybe that means for a profit, maybe that means for nonprofit, maybe that means charitable, maybe that means just uh, ultimately being a better parent and having that be the number one priority of the day. And that's been a huge focus within our household is just, you know, we made all these changes in our life from being two full time, hardworking, 13 year career professional parents and changed everything uh, in service of, uh, of building this new path. Uh, and so that's what I'm passionate about, in addition to plucking a guitar behind me and nerding out every once in a while. Your favorite book? Whew. Best business book. 
most effective for me, Essentialism by Greg McKeown. Mm. Uh, just, I think I've gone through it three times now. Uh, teaches you five ways of saying no with social grace in service of higher priority. Um, man, I, I think best book beyond that on the on the nonfiction or on the fiction front. Gosh, this is going to be so nerdy, but I love sci-fi, man. So like, it's it's still going to go all the way back to stuff that's like the Ender's Game series and stuff. You know, like like this is really nerdy sci-fi stuff. But right. it's it's um it's all that on the personal front. What's your favorite way to make an impact in the community? You know, I think sharing knowledge transparently in in the best way that I can, uh, and I think leaning more into that looking further in 2023 and in 2024, uh, just trying to figure out how to scale that a bit more and doing that in a way that is actually accessible for people. Uh, because it's a beautiful modern world that we live in right now. You can add so much value. You could, you could teach so much and you can do it in ways that is relatively scalable um, and add value without necessarily making it something that is gated for people in a prohibitive way. Um, and so I think being able to just be available for folks without expectation of any kind of return um, has always been for ever since inception of this club, uh, the number one thing that I feel like I've been able to to help with is, you know, coaching without being a coach, uh, as it were. That's it. This has been a great conversation. I've enjoyed this a lot to, to hear your journey from all the way through fintech and what you know your exposure to that world for thirteen years, and then how you got into real estate, really on the active side, if you will, from from what I what I would deem because I owned them too, single family homes, active. <laughs> They, they're not really passive they're active rentals and then right. and then finally found your your home in in passive investing in inside of apartments and and inside of um storage for people who want to find you they want to follow you they want to connect with you where can they go what should they do yeah and this has been a pleasure so thank you for the wonderful discussion you're welcome um folks can find me at madisoninvesting.com that's their website um, we've got plenty of information, educational stuff we're putting up there regularly on the blog, but also they, they can sign up to, uh, to talk with me, uh, and just, you know, potentially join our investor club. So yeah, reach out. Well, wonderful. The links are below in the show notes for everybody. Spencer, thanks so much for your time. Yeah. Thank you, Neil. Really yeah. appreciate it. To our listeners, pat yourself on the back because it made it to the end of the show and most people never finish what they start. If you receive value from today's show, be sure to share it on LinkedIn, your Facebook page, or your social media platform of choice. Subscribe to never miss a valuable episode in the future. And if you found value in today's episode, give us a thumbs up with a positive review. If there's a particular topic you'd like to hear about, well, I wanna hear from you. Shoot me a message on LinkedIn. The link to my profile is below in the show notes. You can connect with me there for more valuable content.